Mm-hmm. I wanted to spend this evening, or I'll introduce myself. Hi. I'm Augusta Hopkins, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and this is specifically Mindful Mondays, and it's a spiritual friend sangha offering, and it's lovely to be here with you. It feels good in my body to just sit down right here with you. And so tonight, it's a kind of a special night because it is the fifth Monday of the month, and that doesn't happen very often. It's not a blue moon, right? The moon is like full tomorrow or something, but it's like practically a blue moon. Did y'all see the moon? It's getting full. Yeah, I noticed it yesterday. It's pretty close. I didn't look it up, but it's pretty close. And maybe it is a blue moon. That's cool. (laughs) (laughs) That's really fun. Got some shimmering going on over here. So what I wanted to do this evening was to really give space for questions for questions about practice, for questions about Dhamma, questions about Dharma, questions about Buddhism, questions about how do I use this understanding of the practice in my life, like all of the things. And so we'll see what happens. And I wanted to begin with a nice solid 40 minutes of practice to help us really settle down into ourselves and see what's there after we've settled that fully. And maybe the 40 minutes is like completely agitated. And so you have lots of questions, right? And maybe it's very settled. And so like the the deepest question inside of you will emerge. And then in that question and response time, we'll enjoy tea together. And those of you who are in person, I have strawberries and almonds, both organic, locally sourced. And those of you who are at home, I trust that you can find a snack in your home. And I'll guide us in a little bit of eating practice, a little bit of mindful eating, and then we'll go into the chitty chatty. So get comfortable. And maybe the body wants to stretch and maybe, you know, you'll you'll lie down or you'll stand up or you'll walk. Your practice, your way. Mm. Mm. Yeah, your practice, your way. There's no right way to do this. I find that maybe this has been true in all time. And I notice it now because I'm alive now. I don't know about five time before. <laughs> but I notice that there can be this way that we want to know. You all heard me say this before, but like the right way the prescription or the recipe and life doesn't work like that. Meditation doesn't work like that. And so in any moment, a particular practice or style or approach to cultivating presence, cultivating awareness might be more helpful for you. Great. You know, find that, try that on, be in exploration, open, curious, receptive, and discerning like, Oh yeah. Right now this kind of broad open practice that Augusta likes to offer, it is not supportive for me. I need something more focused, right? And so if you're here with me, you could open your eyes and look at the candle, if you need a little extra help, or you can rest into the breath or awareness of the body or sound, awareness of the body as a whole, the hands, the feet, a finger, a toe, right? You can get as focused or as broad as is helpful for you. And in that broad or focused awareness, one might open to awareness of sound arising and passing. One of the ways to practice with sound that I find very supportive is noticing the cessation, noticing the fading away. Because when the sound comes in, you're usually like, can't hear the sounds, right? Can we notice how it subsides? It passes away as do all conditioned things. It's like, oh, and there's the cessation of the sound. And then how does that feel in my body? 
How does that feel in my body? What's my heart's response? What's my body's response? Or you might open really broadly and just notice full range of experience arising and passing moment by moment. Beginning, beginning by tuning into the body. And again, maybe a little bit of stretching or a lot of stretching, small or large, is helpful for you to become aware of the body resting here into stillness in whatever posture is supportive, sitting, standing, lying down. And maybe walking if that's what's supportive for you, that's fine. I'm taking the time to listen in and discern, oh, what posture is helpful for me right now? In this heart space, this mind space, the condition of this body in this moment. And then arriving there, consciously, intentionally, Settling into this moment. Feeling the ground beneath you. Beneath your seat and your feet. Beneath your legs and your back. Whatever posture you're in, there is ground beneath you. There is the earth holding us close with the embrace of gravity. We can surrender to that. We can rest into that and trust that gravity has got us. And in addition to the contact points with the furniture and floor, you might also be supported by noticing how the body is contacting the body. Noticing the gentle pressure or weight of the hands slash arms on the lap. Or when lying down, I'm supported by the left hand on the heart and the right hand on the low belly. That gentle pressure and warmth. Or standing, you might notice the arms gently touching the sides of the body. Maybe even one hand is being held by the other hand. Feeling that embrace, that care. A gentle act of love.
You might also notice the gentle pressure as the front top of the tongue rests behind the upper front teeth. And allowing the eyes to close, if that's supportive for you. Or if you're sleepy or tend to fall asleep during meditation, you might open the eyes and allow them to gaze on the flame of the candle or a blank wall or something that is maybe pleasant to look at. A, plant or a flower or something neutral like the floor. Continuing to make choices based on what supports a collecting of energy, a collecting of attention, a Collectedness, as it's sometimes called. so that we can tune into ourselves. Settle into ourselves. And notice. Notice what's going on internally and externally. Moment by moment, always changing. Settling in in a broad and spacious way. Noticing the range of arising and passing experiences. In your own heart, mind, other places in your body, in the environment that surrounds you. All kinds of experiences arising and passing. This is how things are. We can practice to notice these arising and passing experiences and to notice the response of our own heart, mind, and body. To notice if a version arises or greed arises or some kind of delusion. Oh, hi there. And then maybe noticing how that feels in the body. A constriction of the heart or a flow, a settling, kind of spaciness. Oh, we can be present to that too. This internal response, relationship, reaction to the arising and passing experiences of life.
Occasionally asking yourself, what am I aware of now? Is there greed, aversion, or delusion present in the heart-mind? How does that feel in the body, in the heart center? Does the greed show up, aversion or the delusion? What happens in the body? How does it feel inside? Maybe noticing a bracing or a contraction. Or a leaning forward. Or a softening or flow, settling. Or maybe noticing that you don't notice anything or you notice something else, great. We're cultivating awareness. And if you're finding that this practice I'm offering right now is not supportive for you, 
inviting attention to rest on your chosen object of awareness. Sound rising and passing. Experience the body sitting here. Or specifically the fingers or toes, hands or feet. Some other sensation in the body. Maybe the sensation of breath. The nostril, nose, chest or belly, back of the throat. Some other way you notice the breath. More presence and absence of sound, cessation of sound, whatever supports you. And then making a commitment for this practice period. And not bouncing around. But also giving yourself time to discern what's supportive right now, to balance.
Noticing.
gradually expanding the field of awareness to bring in movement and light, whatever level of sightedness is available to you and noticing how it feels to move, however much you can move or are inspired to move at the moment. Noticing how it feels in the body, in the heart, in the mind. And noticing the experience of seeing and the objects of sight, those things that are seen again. What happens in the heart mind in response to the seeing? So we'll take a little bio break. Let's hold the silence. Um, get yourself some tea or a drink. If you're at home, a snack. Or if you brought a snack to share, you can get that out. And Tom, if you're able to come into the circle, that would be lovely. If you're, if that's not, if that's not possible, that's okay too. Hmm? Great, great, great. Oh, First thing we're going to practice is pass around the napkins. <laughs> so 
we can bring mindfulness to anything. And I, I do my best to point to that often in lots of different ways. And today is yet another experience of that, right? We can bring mindfulness to offering a napkin, to receiving a napkin. To offering some almonds, to receiving an almond or some almonds, right? To the to the reach, to the receipt, to the heart space, right? And we're not supposed to be perfect either, right? There's also one of my themes. <laughs> it's like it's not possible. And the freedom that we feel when we have moments of dropping that. Right? And then we pick it back up again. And we're like, ah! it's like, okay, and we can drop it. And it's a practice when we return. It's not like we get it figured out, but it's not a perfect. It's not how it goes. And the same with the strawberry. And I invite you to not eat the strawberries yet. And those of you who are at home, you might notice how it is like, oh, I'm missing out on the almonds and the strawberries and I got my whatever. You know, you're at home, so you have access to sometimes a bounty, sometimes the cupboards are bare, but you know, you're, you have more choice perhaps. In Plum Village, sometimes we have formal tea ceremonies. There's a lot of formality in the passing around and you, you look in each other's eyes and you offer with two hands and you receive with two hands and then everyone waits like, you know, you've got 50 people there. You're just kind of, most of it's in waiting, right? And these little streets get passed around and it's a practice. It's like, oh, well, I'm here. And what's arising in the heart? You know, what's arising in the body? What's arising in the mind? Oh, I can be here with this, right? Like, I can be here with this. <sighs> it's always possible. I wish that we, I hope for myself and for all practitioners to have more and more access to that, greater ease of access, increased frequency of access of like, oh, I can be with this. And if, if you've had a moment like that, oh, I can be with this. Like the whatever it is, it's liberating. There's so much freedom there. It's like, what? This too? I can hold this too? Ooh, it's powerful. It's powerful. Mm. And so you, if you've been practicing with me for a little while, you might notice that there's kind of, I mean, there's a couple of different pairs of themes, but there are these two themes of you know, what's here, can I be with it? And this other side of bringing in a wholesome mind state, bringing in something that feels good, right? Inclining the heart mind toward pleasant. And so we'll do a little bit of that, a little bit of eating. So I invite you to grab a strawberry or if you've got a, a piece of fruit handy or veggie, a glass of water is sufficient, whatever you got over there in the Zoom land. And whatever it is, engage with it in such a way that 
Well, we're going to do a couple more steps first, but when we get to the eating part, then you can receive it in four bites. So if it's small like the strawberry, only a quarter of it the first bite. <laughs> or, you know, maybe it'll be different size bites, but don't eat the whole thing at once. Okay, so first, well, next time. Next time we'll do a bigger mindful eating because you know me, like ends up doing like this. So just the first, just the four bites. So there's a whole big practice that we can engage in through all the sense doors and next time. And today, to support this inclining the mind, right? So with this first bite, I practice, right? It's a practice. With this first bite, I practice the love that brings joy. And so it's an intention. <laughs> And so you take one little bite, let it sit in your mouth, breathe all the way in, breathe all the way out, and then maybe say it again to yourself with this first bite, I practice the love that brings joy. And then you begin to chew. And so it's super, super slowed down, right? You're not going to do this for your whole meal, probably, although it's really wonderful, but we're going to do it together for four bites, all right? Or four sips or whatever you're at, or maybe you're just witnessing. You do you. Okay. <laughs> With this first bite, I practice the love that brings joy. And then officially you'll put the strawberry down, but do whatever you need to do. And then you breathe all the way in and all the way out and all the way in. Maybe saying to yourself again, but this first bite, I practice the love that brings joy. I practice the love that brings joy. And then slowly enjoy your little bite of strawberry, taking your time. And then once you notice that the mouth is empty and only once the mouth is empty, second bite. With the second bite, I practice the love that brings a release from suffering, right? A release from suffering. With the second bite, I practice the love that brings a release from suffering. One and a half breaths. Maybe repeating the phrase. With this second bite, I practice the love that brings a release from suffering. And then beginning to chew. Consciously, intentionally, When the mouth becomes empty, with this third bite, I practice the love of myself. 
with this third bite, I practice love with myself. Breathe all the way in, all the way out, and all the way in. Maybe repeating the phrase to yourself with this third bite that practice the love of myself. And then beginning to chew. And when the mouth is empty, the fourth bite, our final bite for this formal practice today. With this fourth bite, I practice the love of all beings. All the way in, all the way out and all the way in, following the breath. Maybe repeating the phrase with this fourth bite, I practice the love of all beings. Thank you for engaging in the, those four bites. I have found this to be a huge support in my practice over the years. So please continue to enjoy your, your snacks or your drink or whatever you got going on there. Maybe nothing, just witness and that's great too. So we have half an hour, 26 minutes, actually. We're going to end on time tonight. It's my new practice. <laughs> and there's space this evening to offer in questions and we'll see what happens my hope is to post the recording but at the end of the gathering we can say you know what let's not easy peasy you know so let's just make sure i'll take a little bit of help from everyone to check in at the end and say no something came up for me that was confidential we won't post or yeah feels good let's go ahead and share it more broadly so any kinds of practice questions or dharma questions and yeah, you know, have in your mind and your heart what most what would be most supportive for you as far as what, what love will you share or don't share. And, you know, like, it's not important that we share this with the world, but we can if we want to. So you, you take care of you. <laughs> take care of you. And we'll start with Tom and we'll just go around in order of arrival. <laughs> so... And feel free to pass if there isn't something that you want to bring voice to. And if we get all the way around, there'll be another opportunity. Sure. I have two questions. Great. One is, why is this particular thing so hard for me? Mm. Uh, it shouldn't be that difficult, but just showing the strawberry. And I find like I'm so averse to being present in some kind of way. Like mm. every part of me just wants to screw all the way up and say, okay, what's next? And so there's some way in which I really feel like being present 
this very you know, stretched out kind of mindful way. It's really difficult for me. And I just, and I think that's not, I'm not just talking about the strawberry, I'm talking about the rest of my life as well, that I'm just always looking for what's the next thing? What's, okay, what's happening next? What's happening next? And I just, it, it's a puzzle to me about like, why is this being present thing so complicated? So I mean, what do I do about it? Yeah. So is that two questions or is that yeah, one question? question yeah, it's interesting to do this drawings because like I find that when I'm practicing, I get lots of impulses. You know, they're just sort of like, you know, whether it's scratching my nose or eating a burrito or wondering like, you know, gosh, it would be a bad thing if I had a drink after this or it's just I, like I have and it's not that random. There's lots of random thoughts that are just kind of, you know, whatever they have their quality. And, um, you know, some are disturbing, some are trivial, whatever. But there's also this other thing that doesn't feel like it's a thought. It feels like it's an impulse that then a thought sort of forms around it. And the impulse is often, I have to think of it as well. Like it's kind of like hunger. It's not necessarily hunger for food, it's hunger for stimulus or stimulation or. The next thing, and so I'm just also trying to, yeah, think about how do I practice in the face of having these very compelling, very sticky kinds of impulses during the practice and not get into the place of resisting. No, we're not going to do that. You know, there's a kind of a white knuckling thing that I, can, that I find that I can do, but it doesn't feel like it's the right path in a certain way. Thank you. Any questions? I can kind of hear those as the same question, right? Okay. Yeah. So the first question is like, why is it so hard to just sit here and be with this forever? You know, why can't I just be in the present moment? And the way I heard it was, I feel aversive to being present. And I wonder if it might also be true that I'm kind of eager or greedy to go into the next thing. Like I want to get it. I want to keep going. Mm -hmm. Or is it very clearly for you showing up as like a verse of version, a version to be in the present? It feels more like that. Okay, great, cool. And then as you just I think there's also that. Sure. They okay. they come together. Right. So and then as you describe the second thing, it was like these thoughts arising, of course, thoughts are arising. That's how it is. And then there's also this kind of energetic mm -hmm. use the word hunger, which could be, you know, um, kind of leaning into the future or what's next, or it could be this simple, sometimes it's spoken of as becoming, right? Just as like, pay attention. <laughs> I want to do something and I need to exist. Like a way that the self is like, hey, right? It, it could be a similar thing. And maybe, maybe there's something a little bit different that's happening for you. I'm not trying to put them together into one necessarily, but that was how I heard it just now. So does it feel like I'm hearing you? Okay. So how many people can relate to like the mind is busy saying, let's go do this other thing where you're trying to say the meditation. Okay. So at least in the space, that's a hundred percent. First and foremost. <laughs> right? Like that's how it is. That's how it is. And so much is about our relationship to that. Like, oh, there's a thought, maybe I'll have a drink after this. Or there's a thought, oh, a burrito. Or there's a thought, like, whatever. Like, oh, hi. And it's very skillful when we can have the opportunity to not, not try to push all that stuff away, which is part of why my focus these days is not on Apanasati and why I don't stress, like, have an object because then there can be this energy of like, I should be with my object. I need to return my object. I'm doing something wrong. I'm out with my object. <laughs> I'm like, no, like, oh, this is what's happening. There's maybe it's a compulsion. I don't mean that in a pejorative term, but like, oh, there's something arising. Oh, how does that feel in my body? 
who has that desire to scratch the trail? Can I be interested in that? Or can I be interested in the itch? Or can I be interested in the tension that I feel in my body? Because I don't scratch the itch. Like just an itch can be an entire practice, right? And I'm having one right now on my cheek. And if I'm like sitting in practice, just kind of notice it for a little bit. And then usually what happens for me is I lose interest in it. And the experience fades away. The hair might still be tickling my cheek. I don't care so much anymore. Or maybe a breeze has come and it's moved. I don't know. I think different kinds of things happen. But it's like, it passes. And whether what passes is my identification with it and my caring about it, or it's the actual stimulus, it doesn't really matter. But it all passes. Right? Like, And it has to pass in order for the next one to show up. Right, so there's some cognitive knowing that it passes, but it can be really interesting to just feel into that. Like, okay, here I am. I'm here for this ride. Oh, I really want to scratch the itch. How does that feel in the body? Like whatever the journey is. And then you can let me know, right? Yeah, and I think that today, specifically the eating of the strawberry could be a very similar thing. And I want to speak a little bit to that aversion. Right? Like, no. I don't want to be present. And sometimes that comes for me anyway, when someone else is telling me to do something, right? Like I want to be present. I love it. It's so nourishing for me. And if someone else tells me to do it, you get a really different response. So who knows if that could be at play for you specifically this evening with the strawberry or not with some other things in your life that you feel a responsibility to do or you're being asked to do. There might be some kind of um, egoic, like... <clears throat> For me anyway, like inner child tantrum, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it's a great area for exploration. Yeah, I think for me, there's a kind of a trauma history that has to do with being present and then being like, you know, just it's really, it feels really dangerous to yes. be present. And so, you know, I've got, I, you know, I'm heady enough that I think I'm you know, sort of like, okay, I got this, you know, and I, the, but it's sort of limited utility that, Sort of figured out, but I think it's sort of more in that rather than tantruming about it. Oh, it tells me where to go. Mm -hmm. it's, Great. It's, it's more like a phone there to find you or something like that. Yeah. That's why I have to suddenly disappear. Or something. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great noticing, right? So the awareness that this is part of your conditioned experience and how that is showing up in the moment when you feel, when you have that instinct of aversion to being present. To, to kind of look around, tune in, is this what's arising, what you've just described, right? To ask in, into your heart, into your gut, into your body, with whatever was like, oh, is this that? And then, how's that showing up in my body? Can I be with the, this thing that has arisen in the moment? Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. And so now it's it's either Walt or Lisa. You you tell me. I don't know. You both are here before me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was here early. Yeah, go. Good. <laughs> yeah. Worthy. Um, thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for these such tasteful. Tasty, tasteful. Either way, tasty oh. usually in American oh. English anyway. Full of taste. Uh, uh, yeah. Almonds. I've never tasted almonds like that, but the taste is so good. <laughs> it's I don't think it's because it was slow. <laughs> Seriously. It helps the really struggle with the strawberry too. I mm. was like, oh my god, I love food, I love mindful eating, and I can probably stand it. <laughs> At this moment, I just want to eat this thing. <laughs> like, the page in patience. Hmm. Interesting. But that was fun. And, um, yeah, it's interesting how difficult it was, no matter how much I love it. The food itself and the 
the mindful eating does that in other things and yeah, that how the whole space special place in your heart. So it's mm -hmm. uh, fascinating. Maybe like going from that to the question that I have. Before you go to the question, I just want to lift up the way that something can be like really frustrated, annoying, and awful and be fascinating. No. But like that's the fruit of practice. Right? Before you had a meditation practice, when something was really awful and frustrating and annoying, there was nothing interesting about it. Right? We just hated it. But now it's like, oh, it's fascinating. Like that gives us some freedom and space. Like that's really cool. Thanks. So please, but thank you for that. Yeah. Also, I was really hungry, so I was imagining bread. <laughs> so I was really, that was like, when I saw this, I'm like, this is going to be good practice. <laughs> so it goes back to the question, I only have one so far. <laughs> Give me both. <laughs> so similar thing. It's like I've been practicing for like six years now. Gradually, like increasing. For me, that's like a lot of time, <laughs> of dedication. And still to this day, I feel resistance. Every single time, like in the morning, I would have, and like my mind would go, <laughs> I know that I should wake up and like go first thing and sit mm -hmm. and that is nourishing and I get so much benefit, but then it will go like, let's go take a shower, and let's go look in the fridge, <laughs> let's do something. And it's just, I've been observing this lately and I'm like, how come this still happens? Is it like something that never goes away? And like even today, we like I got here early, and then like when it comes time, mm -hmm. there is this little like push. Like I don't know. I'm really curious about that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So uh, the question that I hear is, even though I've been practicing for six years and I really benefit from it, and I'm committed to my practice, yeah. every day I'm like I don't really want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in addition to the I don't really want to do it, I heard there's these other things that creep in and say, this is more important, I should yeah. do this. Right. So I can relate into the this is more important, I should do this part. Um I'm getting close to 20 years of formal practice. And I noticed that still there's this idea that some other thing is more important. And that's just delusion. It's just delusion. And it creeps in. And I think it's one of the reasons that having a community is so helpful, being a part of a sangha, living at a monastery, like having the support that's showing us, it's telling us, it's enacting the preciousness of it and how important it is. And this is what we're doing as a collective. This is what we're doing. And not all of us struggle with this, but I know for me that the more I go to the monastery or I go on retreat with frequency and regularity, the more it supports my at-home practice, the more it supports my daily practice. And now, Having come back from the monastery, I don't even know now, a week ago, two weeks ago, sometime recently, I, I've had many days where I've put in much more time to my formal practice than I typically do in my life. Like a solid two hours at the beginning of the day and then chanting. And that is not what my life supports typically or allows for what I prioritize. And then some of the days in this brief period of time after coming back from a Bayagiri, I, oh yes, it was two weeks ago because I remember talking about sexism a lot two weeks ago. <laughs> um, and even some of those days, there's this compulsion like that I should, 
be doing something else, whether it's checking my phone or responding to an email or taking care of that other responsibility. Like in this modern life, we as a as a lay person, as a householder, I have lots of other responsibilities. And they creep it and they say, I'm more important. And so it's a real practice to just say, nope, nope, you're not. This is the most important thing right now. And sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder, but the frequent returning to meditation retreats or monasteries, practice centers helps me with that, to have that just be, get a little quieter, right? Or to not believe it so much. And some like super pragmatic things that are helpful for me are like, so when I first decided that I was going to have a daily practice, I had been practicing with the precepts for some years already. And I had a sangha and I was meditating. I didn't have a daily practice. The sangha, one of the sanghas I was a part of at the time, the teacher was encouraging us. It was January. And he said, okay, I want to really support you to have a daily practice. So he put us into these small groups of four. We were little texting teams and we texted each other each day. I sat and some of us would say that sometimes like, oh, I would do yoga or I do walking meditation or like, you know, it's very small things, just, just announcements, not conversations, but just like, oh, I did this. And that was really helpful for me to have a sangha supporting me for the dailiness of it. Mm -hmm. And in that container, making a commitment to daily practice I needed to find the time. And so I meant getting up earlier. And so I set an alarm and I put it in the other room and I had to get out of bed to turn the alarm off. So I went and got out of bed and I turned the alarm off. I went to the bathroom and then I got down on my cushion and I sat. And that like newly freshly carved out time was very helpful for me to have freedom from the store that I should be doing something else. Like, no, 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 this is what I do with this time. So more, uh, there's more coming. So like, I'm going back in time a little bit later. So that was super helpful for me. And I was a little tired at first, but after a few days of getting up consistently at the same time, I started to go to sleep a little earlier. It wasn't a big deal anymore. It didn't take very long. I was a little bit surprised. And so fast forward to today with these, these invasive thoughts of these other things being more important. It's just like, it's not more important to remind myself of that. And today, specifically this morning, I only meditated for half an hour because I didn't sleep very well. I was awake in the middle of the night for hours. And even though I kind of meditated in that period of time, I, I chose to sleep in this morning because I wasn't well rested. And so I only had half an hour for practice. But, you know, it used to be I only had two seconds for practice when I, so it was like, being also being gentle and supportive to myself of like what I did do, like five minutes is great. I've often quoted, maybe not in this group, but Howie Cohen, an insight teacher here in San Francisco, he says, get your tush on the cush. Right? So have your whole thing set up and maybe today you can't practice, but you set it up and put your, put your backside down there so that tomorrow it's more available. Mm -hmm. Which is not exactly the question that you're asking, but it's all really related for me. I have another continuation. Great, please. It's it's um I do wake up early for it. I would do that. My thing was more like this internal like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the internal yeah, I think what comes to me is something similar to what I was saying to Tom. Like explore that, play with that. Can that be your object of awareness? You just saw it. Sure. And so that, so then the, uh, it's so annoying. The annoyance can be your object of awareness. How does that feel in the body? And maybe some story will unfold. Like Tom is saying, oh, he thinks that this story is underneath part of that. Like maybe a story will unfold. You can befriend that story with, you can befriend that story with, kindness and care and tenderness and curiosity openness right great wonderful let me know yeah Walt, would you like to offer a question no 
And I think that then we have Sophie and then Diane, if I'm, if I'm continuing to track the order as I'm intending to. Um, thank you for bringing the food and sharing this delightful. Um, I have a small question. Uh, something that happens for me sometimes uh, when I practice, especially for extended time, um, a song in my head. <laughs> Uh, and I think my question, I guess, is like, is this the same thing as a thought? Because mm. the, the way I let go of thought doesn't work for the song. It kind of feels like the song just want to play itself to the end. <laughs> and then that's pretty she loop back again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. And you said particularly for longer practice, how, many, how much is longer? Like today. Like first. today. Mm -hmm. So if you're practicing for longer than what length of time does this happen more often? Or does it just happen? Yeah, I think it just happens. It just happens. Okay. So the question, as I understand it, is what about songs, these looping songs? Some people call these like earworms, or you just have a song that keeps going in your mind, whether you're meditating or not, just kind of going. So what about that? How do I practice with that? Is it kind of like thoughts? And then it doesn't seem to work with what I do when I practice awareness of thoughts. Yeah. <clears throat> I probably have lots of different types of answers to that question. So we can enjoy the bells. The time goes so fast. As I was listening to the bells, I was saying we had a half an hour. But that's actually our time. <laughs> so maybe we'll do this again sooner than later, not wait until the next time we have a fifth Monday. So where I am today in my practice is I don't worry about it too much. I've noticed that I can drop into a deep experience of collectedness, even with the thinking happening back there. Like it doesn't matter. And I wonder if having that relationship to the thinking of like not really caring about it, it's a part of why I can still drop into a deep samadhi with the thought track. You might play with noticing your response to the thinking. Just kind of, we're getting, there's a theme going here tonight, right? Like. Noticing your response to it, right? The, the not wanting it or the liking it or the being annoyed by it or the why is this happening or what do I do with this? Like whatever that is, how does that feel in the body? Like, to be curious about the, the heart response that's showing up to the external experience or internal experience, right? To the thing that's arisen or that's arising. Yeah. I've noticed that for me as I, when I'm listening to or bringing in certain kinds of things, like there are so many practice songs in the Plum Village tradition. So I'm like listening to practice songs or more recently lately, as I've been chanting with the Abaya Hearing chanting book, the Amravati chanting book, chants just arise, like out in my life. I'm like, oh, this is a cool thing to just kind of arise <laughs> into my awareness. Like, yeah, right? So some of it is about like, what are the inputs? You know, what it's, one of the four nutrients, like what are the nutrients that we're taking in through the sense door of the year? Oh, that's what's going to arise. 
right? Because stuff's going to arise. Like, it's not the stuff's not going to arise. We're not going to, like, get to a place where, like, nothing's arising. We're like, oh, we can have some influence over what arises, and we can cultivate a relationship to what arises. It's allowing it to be there and being curious. Like, oh. Yeah, and that might not be very available to you at the moment. It might be totally available. So you can try that on if you like. When you're practicing, are you practicing kind of a broad awareness or are you practicing with a specific focus of attention? Usually with the breath. With the breath. <clears throat> okay, so you can you can just, if the breath is supportive for you, you can just engage in a, a noting practice like, oh, there's that song, how's the breath? Oh, there's that song, how's the breath? And to see how much gentleness you can bring to that, like, Oh, there's the song breath, oh, breath, oh, breath. Because if there's gentleness in the returning to awareness of the breath, it can be a very supportive anchor. If there's the, you're supposed to be with your breath. I feel like it can be, it can not be as supportive, right? But it's like, oh, I, there's that familiar song or there's this familiar experience of, of hearing a song like and something else that I've done a lot of this I got from Andrea Fella which has been helpful for me is like so maybe it's in the realm of thinking maybe it's not in the realm of thinking it's I don't know how to identify it but I understand the question one can simply notice Andre has taught the suggestion to notice like how you're thinking like what's the thinking like sometimes we think in talking sometimes we think in listening I find myself spelling. I'm not, a, I, mm -hmm. I'm dyslexic and not a very good speller as a result. So as a child, I just kind of would spell things sometimes randomly. So like that happens in meditation, like, oh, spelling. Okay. So like awareness of spelling, right? So like, oh, just like awareness of like, oh, awareness of song. Like, well, oh, that's how the thinking's arising in the moment. Okay. And everything that can help this, like this shoulder action of, oh, okay. This is what's here. And then settling as you are these days, like, Settling back into awareness of the breath. Oh, my friends. And let me know. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. I hope that the answers are helpful for everybody. Oh, so anyway, the practicing together today and being with one another may support you. Know that it is benefit to all beings. And may it bring peace and liberation. Mm -hmm. And next week we'll engage with mindfulness trainings and precepts as we do on the first Monday of each month. Any announcements, Tom? Uh, it's just that the collective survives on the basis of everybody's generosity, whether that's time or money or credit cards or whatever. So if you can manage. And uh, I'd like to invite people to continue their practice by using the compost bin, mm -hmm. sink in the back to in your teacups or get rid of their things here, which otherwise back to your compost bin. There we go. Great. Much Thank you so much. Yeah. And this practice of generosity. It's a really powerful practice and is not supported in the West very much. We're really not encouraged to be generous. We're encouraged to like take care of our own or get what we need. And it's a really real, real scarcity mentality. And it can be a powerful experience to touch in to really sharing in a way that's supportive for you, you know, like for you. But it's cool. You might just take a moment as we wrap up here to notice how it feels in your body to be in this no, I need to take care of like that kind of protective stance, which is sometimes really appropriate, right? It's an appropriate response in certain moments. And how it feels to be expansive and generous. And you find your way. You find your way, you do what works for you. And, you know, it might be different each week or each moment, each time you come, you know? And... Like Tom said, and last week so beautifully, like this is not a fee-for-service model. That is not what we're doing here. So if it's important for you to come, come 
And if it's supported you for, to offer time, money, or energy, offer. And if it doesn't work, great. No problem. No problem. Take care of yourself. That's the most important thing. All right. Lots of love. See you next time. <laughs> Let's get out of here.